Mr. Miller, ladies and gentlemen, um, sadly that's all we have time for tonight. <laughs> Can I first say the, the very obvious thing, that it is um, a real pleasure, a real privilege to be in this room with you all tonight, um, to talk or to see the film of the icon that was Tiger Pottori to start with sets a tone which I think raises us all. Um, to see film of myself afterwards is almost embarrassing, um, but, quite, but quite pleasant as well. I can, I, I, can, I can tell I've been looking for some of those photographs the last few years. Now I know where they've gone. Can I have them back, please? First of all, the most important thing to recognize is that the whole basis of tonight is that man, Tiger Patordi. Two icons in one name, if I can say that. First of all, the most beautiful beast, once hunted by many, yet treasured for its rarity. Secondly, the most beautiful batsman, hunted less successfully by bowlers around the world, and treasured today as an equally rare and special beast. And there is indelibly a link between the two. As some of you will realize, as Lakendra was saying just now, one of my many passions uh, around the world, not just in India, is wildlife, is conservation. And uh, although the, the basis of my talk tonight will indeed be about cricket, the subject I'm sure you'd much prefer to hear about, uh, something which I'm sure most of you know more about than I do, to be honest, because I've got used to that over the years. You come to India, everyone is an expert on the game. <laughs> but if I can take a moment just to uh, take a flashback to my first visit to this very city, this wonderful city, uh, Calcutta as it was then, Calcutta as it is now. Um, apart from the cricket, apart from the site of Eden Gardens, stacked full of people, 100,000 people or so for that first test match that I was part of here in 1981-2, apart from the sheer atmosphere, the weight of love for the game that you feel in a place like this, one of the things that stood out was that Although we stayed in this self-same hotel, this magnificent Oberoi Grand Hotel, one of our refuges during that time, during that tour, was the Tolly Gunge Club, uh, hosted by two other icons, two other legends, Bob and Anne Wright, uh, both of whom, I suppose, fitted what you might describe as the colonial mold beautifully, both of whom were superb hosts. In Anne's case, she was head of World Wildlife Fund in India at the time, and on the back of that friendship, which grew over the years and stayed firm over the years, was my first experience of going into the inner parts of this, one, this fantastic country, to Kana, to the wildlife reserve at Kana, and seeing my first tiger in the wild. And much as though, uh, much though I love looking back on the game of cricket and everything that's been achieved uh, around the world and my own record around the world, things like that remain unique. So to be here tonight, um, to talk about, in a sense, both tigers. Again, I find that a huge honor and a huge pleasure. Um, the title, the title of this uh, few well-chosen words and probably one or two not so well-chosen words is fun, style, and excellence. And it comes from something that I was presented with at the end of my career. Um, ironically, it came from a journalist in a paper in the UK, The Independent, uh, a journalist who I'd known all my career, who's Love of a, a well-chosen word didn't always marry the truth of the incidents he was reporting. Uh, I'm sure anyone in this room who's ever worked for a newspaper will understand that concept, uh, including my good host and friend, Lakendra Pradapsahi. Um, but this guy, Martin Johnson, became legendary around the world in many ways because he, he found ways of saying things. He was the man who coined the phrase in Australia in 1986 at the end of the first month of that tour, where we played woeful cricket, that there are only three things this England side cannot do. They cannot bat, they cannot bowl, they cannot field. <laughs> and I have to say, at that precise moment, he was absolutely right. A couple of months later, when we'd won the Ashes, won the one-day competitions and everything else, he rewrote that same quote, said, right, quote, wrong team. <laughs> so he wasn't above self-correction. Um, but he was responsible for this trophy at the end of it. It was a... It was, uh, it was about so big. It was basically a couple of pages of a book with the inscription for fun, style, and excellence. So that, to me, was a fitting way to finish when I left the field of play and headed for the commentary box and studio, which is where I've been pretty much ever since. To give you background, um, 
just briefly a bit of background. Um, if I'm allowed to use the word colonial um, in this modern age, I was a colonial child in East Africa, in Tanganyika. What was then Tanz Tanganyika is now Tanzania. Brought up for the first six years in Dar es Salaam. You saw one or two pictures there of a young man wearing red shorts and lots of blonde hair. Um, I haven't still got the red shorts. I've lost the blonde hair, uh, but it's still the same man underneath at the core. But that was my father at the other end. That was where I first started to play the game of cricket. That's where I first came across the wildlife, actually, with the fantastic game parks of the Serengeti, Lake Manyara and Gorongora Crater that were a formative experience there. I was privately educated, I have to confess to that. Uh, it's in the record books, I can't argue with it, I can't deny it. Um, and one of the most relevant parts of that is that uh, the opportunities I got at both my prep school, a place called Marlborough House, and my senior school, the King's School, Canterbury, is that on both occasions we had people there in charge of the game of cricket and all other sports who knew how to nurture talent, how to let me develop, how to let the whatever flair, whatever natural talent was there, how to let it prosper, how to let it grow. And to them, I am very, very grateful. When I left Kings, I had already joined Leicestershire, my first of two counties. Hampshire was my second county. And I started with them in 1975. I went to university for one brief year. Uh, as an encouragement to all of those who say that a university career is vital, I can tell you my short career didn't, in the end, hamper any of my prospects. And I can tell you a little story about that too. Um, I was, you won't believe this, I understand this, but I was actually technically reading what they call law. Um, I have yet technically to find the library, therefore the expression uh, reading law is probably not entirely accurate. Uh, one of the subjects that, involved, uh, that I was involved in for that uh, first and only year at university at UCL was Roman law, which is an arcane topic at the best of times, I can tell you. And if there are any lawyers in this room tonight, I'm sure they'll back me up on that. Uh, my Roman law professor, who I saw only because his lectures came after 11 o'clock in the morning, and otherwise it would have been too early for me in a normal working day. My Roman law professor was a fellow called Professor Thomas. Uh, I didn't have time to say goodbye to him at the end of my career there because the day after I finished my last exam, I went to Worcester to play a Benson Hedges quarterfinal for Leicestershire against Worcester. I didn't have time to say goodbye. But he was also an MCC member. And over the next two or three years, I would see Professor Thomas in the long room uh, looking suitably austere and we would nod at each other and acknowledge each other's presence. When things started to go properly well and I was eventually playing for England, he eventually caught my eye and said, I think you made the right decision. <laughs> In terms of a cricketing upbringing, I had two captains, county and country, both as it happens from Yorkshire. Uh, not that they were identical twins in any shape or form. My county captain was a fellow called Railingworth who won the Ashes famously down in Australia in 1970, a tour where people like John Snow came to the fore, and a tour which was a tough ask for anyone, but he made his reputation on that tour. He was by now captain of Leicestershire. Uh, when I first played for England, my captain was Mike Brealy, and as I say, if you understand the game, you know the game, you know the characters, two very, very different characters, even though they were born in that same county. Both had the same things. Both had an infinite knowledge of players, an infinite ability to assess situations, and both had the ability to keep that talent going in the right direction. In fact, Raymond, when I first got to Leicester and first realized there was some talent there, he said his job was to turn me from being a gifted amateur into a gifted professional. And I think we just about got there, although, to be fair, not entirely. Um, I've always liked to keep my amateur status, um, even though this is now a very, very professional game in every shape and form. And one of his first tasks, despite the fact that apparently I maintain standards at all times in terms of keeping the tie knotted beautifully, the suit should be reasonably well cut, uh, the cufflinks do in fact have elephants on them, uh, the socks are matching and the shoes are beautifully polished black. There was a time when I was a little bit more casual. At the start of my career, uh, so-called in county cricket, the standard address was described as smart casual. As an 18, 19 year old, you find now and again you get up in a hurry and you've got to get into a car and drive quickly from Leicester to Nottingham, for an example. And when I arrived there once, I found I got one brown shoe, one black shoe. <laughs> um, the captain, of course, notices these things and there was a, a word, a quiet word had at one stage about standards of dress. And so I responded by taking a dinner suit with me to the next away match at Taunton against Somerset and arrived at breakfast on Sunday morning wearing this dinner suit. 
Raymond's, yes, Raymond's response was, response was classic. He said, hey, oh, have you just come in? <laughs> and if only I'd had the knowledge and presence of mind to say, who do you think I am, Dennis Compton, I would have had the final word. Uh, but things, things progress, things move on, um, and here I am many, many years later talking about these same topics of fun, style, and excellence in the game of cricket as we know it now. Um, I'm not going to bore you about uh, you know, every game I've played or every test match we've won or the many we've lost or any of that sort of stuff, but I just want to compare, if I can, compare and contrast maybe some of the things that are still important in the game, some of the things that are obviously brand new in the game, uh, and just make sure we understand what, what really counts in this game. Um, for instance, we know full well, all of us as cricket fans, as cricket lovers, as cricket watchers, know that the game has moved on. Um, it is more professional, literally, in the sense there is infinitely more money in the game year by year. And uh, on a night when IPL is taking place just down the road at Eden Gardens, we know what a difference that has made to the economies both of the BCCI, uh, the many owners of the franchises, and maybe the entire nation as well. Money is not everything, we know that. Um, but the game is prospering. Certainly in this part of the world, it is prospering incredibly well. Um, but it's not just money. It is things like fitness. If you look at the man who I think, and I'm not just playing to an audience, I promise you, but if you look at a man who I think is the best player in the world currently, none other than Virat Kohli, and I don't suppose I'm going to get many arguments on that in here tonight. If you look at Virat, he has set new standards of performance, but definitely that is based 100% on new standards of preparation and fitness. Um, when I compare, for instance, my first proud moment, when you get what you get from the what was then the, sorry what was then the Test and County Cricket Board in the UK, now the ECB, what you get when you play your Test matches is a little card, nicely printed with, in our case, uh, blue, yellow, and red rim, the colours of England, especially the colours of MCC and the touring sides that came across the world, with a nice little invitation saying, you're invited to represent England in the first test starting at Esbiston on July the 8th, whatever it might be. Um, to this date, I've not heard of anyone who's responded, no, thank you. <laughs> but it is, or even anything worse than that, but it is, it is obviously a proud moment when you get that. But our first, my first meeting of that England test team, and this goes back to 1978, was three o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday afternoon before the day of that first test match against Pakistan, as it happens. And you basically had time for a quick net, a cup of tea, uh, dinner in the evening. Uh, Mike Brearley was the captain, as I mentioned earlier. Mike Brearley, my first international captain, who had a real way with words that you will have heard in the same room before. And so your, your team speech basically goes along the lines of how you will make lots of runs, how the opposition will make no runs, and how you'll win the game by an absolute distance. And that's never changed. I've given many a team speech myself like that, even against the West Indies, when, yes, games did feel rather swift and did come to a quick conclusion. In fact, I think I can safely say to be almost totally responsible as England's captain against the West Indies in the 80s as at rekindling the old system of three-day test matches. <laughs> but as I say, the money, the professionalism, that is all new, it's all different, it's all increased. It doesn't mean that there is any lack of standard, or it doesn't mean, I mean, lots of us look back fondly on previous eras. Lots of us look back at the people that played before us, those with the sense of history. We'll look back at the great names of the generation before, those of us who played with, in my case, the likes of Ian Botham, um, Viv Richards, the Chapel Brothers for Australia, Rod Marsh, Lillian Thompson, um, Sunil Gavaskar, uh, all these people, I mean, I, I could go on, you can, I could spend the next 40 minutes naming names, but that would be rather dull, to be honest. But all these great names that you've played against, you remember as part of the history before you, the history of your game at the time. And one of the great things for me, for people like me, is when you stay in the game as a commentator, as an observer, you see the next generations coming through. And we have, again, I'll mention a few names. We have Coley, we have Williamson, Root, Smith, Gale, all very different, Doney, Butler, Stokes, Holder. Anderson, Bumrah, Boovey, Stain. I mean, it, there are a million names, a thousand names you can come out with of the current era. People who inspire others to play, people who you love watching. The standards are right up there. Um, and if, if, for instance, you have a favorite player, 
that I never mention or haven't mentioned. Um, I was taught the lesson here. I once wrote a, a little book a few years ago now, The 50 Greatest Cricketers of All Time, in my, in my literal book. Um, and of course, 50 out of the history of the game, which spans 140 years or so, uh, you've got no chance that everyone is going to agree with you. And even at the launch of that book, having sweated and agonized over which 50, not including me, I hasten to add, were the 50 greatest in the history of the game, some of whom obviously I'd never had the chance to see play, having sweated and agonized about those decisions, even the editor of the company who published the book said, well, why wasn't, and in his case he said, Ted Dexter in that book? And I learned the lesson then that everyone who wasn't in the book was number 51. So if I don't mention your favorite player, he is the next man on my list. And it's only time that says I cannot mention him. What makes these great players? Um, well, again, the same things that always made great players. What makes them is talent, determination, and ambition. What defines them in the end is probably how they play the game, because talent is so much, ambition is so much, determination is so much. There are ways of playing this game that will endear you to those that watch, and there are ways of doing it that might be a little bit different. I mean, there are many players nowadays who can walk out there at Eden Gardens, at Lords, at the Sydney Cricket Ground, wherever they are, at Newlands, I could go around the world and keep naming names yet again, who walk out there with a smile on their faces and they obviously love what they do. And that, to me, is the epitome of everything one should be doing when you're playing cricket or any sport. It is that sheer love of being out there, that sheer love of competition, and the ability, equally so, to put that love and passion across to those that watch. And it is that, that is the only way I think that you endear yourself to those that watch, those that pay you to be there, those that come to enjoy what you do and to promote the game. I mean, there are other, there are other ways of doing it, to be fair. Uh, for some, winning would appear to be the only thing. For some, winning at all costs is the only thing. Um, it probably won't surprise you from everything you've seen before, even heard so far this evening, that I'm not entirely of that school. Um, for some reason, when I was talking about that, the name David Warner sprung to mind. And I think, as I said in the Telegraph only this morning, I suspect he's not quite a soulmate. Uh, I'm not going to go into the things he is uh, associated with as such, but let me just say that there are ways of winning cricket games that do not need sandpaper. For others, all those things are still true, but sometimes you know, achievement, the end product, is important. Um, and this is not a criticism, but we have a man called Alistair Cook, um, who retired from the England team at the end of our last summer. Uh, and Alistair, if you look at those things we talk about at the top, fun, style, and excellence, certainly has excellence. Um, he actually has a sense of fun off the field. He does all sorts of things off the field that count as fun and make him a rounded character. Uh, style, people argue about that. I've seen it in papers, I've seen it in the media where when he was awarded the knighthood, and I'll give you a clue, I'll give you a clue here. Sir Alistair Cook, uh, the reason for that is his productivity. The reason for that is that talent is not just about how you make contact with cricket bat on cricket ball but it's how you arrange your mind, how your mind allows you to be the best you can be at all times. And you know, hand up, I was not the best I could be at all times, but various people, and it seems most of them seem to come from Essex, have the ability to concentrate more readily. I have no idea why that link is at all relevant. I mean, normally speaking, you say it's completely the opposite, to be honest, but there you are. But Alistair Cook had that great talent to be the best he could be pretty much at all times. And the difference is very obvious in the statistics. 12,472 runs at 45.35 as an opening batsman against, in my case, 8,231 runs at 44.25. I am 4,231 runs down. That's why he is Sir Alistair. <laughs> in my defense, I can claim two honorary doctorates from places that used to be polytechnics and now claim to be universities. And the extraordinary thing about Alistair is despite, here, here we are talking about you know, one of the cricketers who over the last decade plus has made his reputation solid throughout the world. The extraordinary thing is I have colleagues in those commentary boxes, one of them who I'm very fond of is a fellow called Michael Holding, Mikey Holding, who was 
dare I say it, a lot of trouble in the 80s when he was at the other end. And I, again, I can name a long list of people holding Marshall, Croft, Garner, Roberts, Patterson, Sylvester Clark, who hardly played for the West Indies, who caused an awful lot of trouble from the distance of 20 yards and made one quite often think about things like insurance and an alternative career. <laughs> but Mikey is, is one of those lovely men who is infinitely nicer to be alongside in a commentary box with plenty of opinions. The voice that I think drops women from about the, the range of a thousand meters regularly. It's an extraordinary voice. And one of the things he's stood by for the last 10 years, whenever he talks about Alistair Cook, he says, the man can't bat. <laughs> now, I mean, we, it's <laughs> eventually he has had to concede that maybe there was a combination of some talent and a huge strength of mind that allowed the man who can't bat to end up with 12,472 runs. And he has conceded a little bit on that now, but it's just, just the way the man is. So what do you have? You have a, if you're looking for a great player, you've got a combination of talent and temperament, I think is a safe way to put it. Cook has his abilities, the strong mind being the, the, the major part of it, I would say. If you look at, again, the obvious example in, in Virat Kohli, he has immense talent, the fitness I talked about just now, he seems to absorb pressure, he seems to thrive on pressure, he has the temperament that coaches are playing for pretty much everyone. And of course, anyone um, ever who has captained India knows that there is an immense expectation from one point, whatever it is, three billion people now, that things will go well. And that's it. That is the end of the story. Things must go well. So he has a temperament to deal with that. Um, I'm going to pick out Viv Richards as well as the, the most exciting, the most awesome batsman that I played against uh, in 15 years of international cricket. Viv, who had uh, something else as well. I mean, all these great players have those things we talked about. But Viv had on his side as well an immense pride and passion, first of all, for his home of Antigua, the island of Antigua. And remember, of course, that the West Indies as a cricket team is a region, it's not a, it's not a nation. But from Clive Lloyd and others before him, Clive Lloyd, Viv Richards, had the ability to, to lead what was a de facto nation, because that's what it became, that's what the West Indies team became. It became the strongest team in the world, probably ever, on the back of Clive Lloyd's nous, Viv Richards' spirit, and pride in his region, and pride in his heritage. And again, I look back at Viv, when I was trying to captain England in the Caribbean in 1986 and coming second by the same margin for the second time, uh, ten, I'll just, just refresh your memories. Ten tests as captain of England against the West Indies, a 100% record. <laughs> when I was trying at least to look the part, you know, we would walk out, say, at Queen's Park Oval in Port of Spain. I would at least try and make sure we had clean whites, clean boots, as established earlier. Uh, maybe the England blazer, just in case. And Viv would walk out with a sort of pair of maroon tracksuit bottoms, a grey t-shirt and a beanie hat or something like that. And again, you'd know, well, you can tell how things worked out there because he is also Sir Vivian Richards. <laughs> there are all sorts of characters. Um, I mean, again, another... Another man I came up against as captain of England, Alan Border. Um, AB, who doesn't come into the category of necessarily pretty to watch, and that is certainly not a disrespectful thing to say. AB, who was one of the finest players and one of the bravest players of that era in the 80s, who got as many or more runs against that West Indies team of that era than anyone anywhere in the world, and took a few blows in the process. Here's the rub. Uh, when I first came across Alan Border, um, it was at the end of the 70s, 78, 79 series in Australia. His first Ashes, my first Ashes. And he did all right. Came in at the end of the series there, made some runs at Sydney. And we got on well. Um, when he came to England as captain of Australia in 1985, that series referred to earlier, which is one I always look back on very, very happily, of course, as a winning captain. When he came then, we used to do the normal things. We would talk to each other, not just at the toss, um, but during the game, there would be jokey asides, little things that we walked off the field. Um, I used to think, uh, I, mean, I used to love it too, I used to think that 
The enemy was sent to the enemy on the field, um, but it didn't stop you talking to him or at him sometimes. It didn't stop you, that old system in dressing rooms at the end of the day where players would mingle at the end of the day in the dress. Whatever had happened during the day, you might have been hit on the head ten times, hopefully only by a cricket ball. Uh, you might have been abused vocally. You might have had, you know, you might have felt like war, like battle out there. But actually you got together at the end of the day, you made friends, you got to know your enemy, and you understood him better. That's why I still count someone like AB as a friend today. Uh, yet, so 85, we had this jokey, chatty, happy existence, and England won. Four years later, the same man had transformed himself into a completely different character. To say he was taciturn would be a huge understatement. On this occasion, first test match, uh, which would have been Headingley again, we shook hands at the toss. His only words were heads. Sorry, one word, heads. I won the toss. We stuck them in. They got 600. <laughs> For four matches, he said virtually nothing to me on the field or off the field. He didn't say much more to his own team, apparently. He was uh, ca christened Captain Grumpy on that tour. But his sole motivation was to win that series, to win the Ashes back for Australia. And he did it very, very comfortably. Only when the Ashes were secure did he finally come to me and say, look, I'm, I'm sorry, mate, you know, it's, uh, it's just the way I had to be. And the only blood I drew on that tour, literally, was this. After the Ashes sadly had gone in the opposite direction this time, Australia came to Leicester, my hometown at the time, my county at the time, to play uh, against the county side. I invited AB and David Boone round to my house for a little bit of something to eat and drink. And with all due respect, we celebrated his Ashes win with a bottle of champagne. Now, I hope... Uh, no, please, yes. <laughs> now, this is referring to style, because, yes, I agree, in, and I agree entirely with what I hope that meant, which is not that you're just applauding Australia, but that the idea of celebrating an opposition captain's win with a bottle of champagne should never die. And the way to open a bottle of champagne, well, one of the ways to do it is what they call sabrage. And traditionally, this involves a French cavalry sabre. And the technique is bottle in hand, sabre slides up the side, catches the rim, and the rim and the cork fly 10 meters into the distance. The bottle starts to bubble, and you pour. Allegedly, this is entirely safe, and any shards of glass will go with the bottle, with the cork, over there somewhere. On this particular occasion, two things went slightly wrong. Uh, one is I don't own a cavalry sword. <laughs> so my weapon of choice was a garden axe. <laughs> Secondly, uh, although the operation was performed as smoothly as you had hoped, and cork and rim disappeared into the garden over there somewhere, one tiny little shard of glass went left and caught AB just above the eye. As I say, the only blood I drew. <laughs> there are so many ways of getting the job done when it comes to this game nowadays. Um, thinking about what is going on just across the road tonight with IPL, which again is the most extraordinary thing that has happened in this country for many, many years. And you think about the way the cricket has changed from being tests and ODIs to now tests and ODIs and international T20s, how domestic cricket around the world has gone. When I first played championship cricket in the UK, it was championship, Nat West or Gillette, 60 over games, Benson Hedges, 55 over games. The shortest game we had was Sunday afternoons, 40 overs. And that felt like a, a very quick game indeed. Nowadays, you've got T20, you've even got 10 over matches. The game, in some ways, is running out of time. We don't have enough time to play at all. In other ways, is using up very little time. But you look at the talent that's on show, for instance, just across the road tonight and in this competition just over the next six, seven weeks or so. And there are various ways of doing this. You've got Chris Gale, yet again, universe boss. The man is nothing if not modest. But he's got a lot to be modest about, I can tell you. But you have a man like that who can hit a ball what seems like a million miles, um, a sheer muscular presence, but with huge talent. 
Um, in this current IPL, I've been watching highlights overnight, Kane Williamson from New Zealand, who is, yes, he's fit, yes, he's strong. He's not the size of Chris Gale, but he's allowed to use technique and timing and skill to maneuver a ball into various parts of the ground just as effectively as anyone else. A.B. de Villiers, who over the last 10 years or so has made an extraordinary name for himself from South Africa as a man for all seasons. And of course, you know, in between all these people, the muscle men and the artists who still remain, and one artist I'm gonna mention briefly as well, who's now retired, of course, Mahela Jaya Wardner. Who could not admire the silky skills of Mahela? Not a big man, he stands about here. He's certainly not a muscle man, but he could do well, he could prosper, he could exceed, do exceedingly well in test matches, ODIs, T20s, wherever. And again, you have the man who bridges the gap, Virat Kohli, who is uh, making hundreds for fun, it seems, in virtually every game he plays. And so you have this capacity to absorb all, to have all these styles, all these people in amongst this great game of ours. It is also, this, this gives me a chance to reflect on something rather recent, and again, I won't dwell on this. But style also reflects how you play the game. All those things I've talked about uh, in terms of getting the job done, getting games won, uh, providing entertainment, of course, which is very much part of it. But to me, the thing that I'll always come back to is the style, the way you get things done, how you are in the process of being a sportsman. Um, and I'm not using this opportunity to castigate, I'm not using this opportunity to dramatize, but in a sense, it was a gift from wherever, I don't say the gods, a gift from somewhere that two days ago we had an incident involving Joss Butler and R. Ashwin, which, judging by my phone and Twitter, has got one or two people rather excited, to say the least. Judging by our own Telegraph publication, it's got them excited too as well. And everyone is asking the question about was this right, was this wrong, um, what is your opinion? And as it is current, and as we have, you know, as I'm here, I feel I should say at least something about it. Uh, and my view is this, as I expressed to Lakendra just yesterday, my view is this, what happened with the man cutting was wrong. Um, I think that you need to look at history. I think you need to look at the old convention whereby if such things were contemplated, there would normally be a warning. Yes, it is not a law. It is not written into the laws of the game. And whatever happened in that incident was entirely lawful. But I think it was a, a, an event that could have been avoided. I don't think, for instance, Butler was trying to gain any advantage. I looked at the footage. He'd hardly gone anywhere when Ravi Ashrin stopped his action and took the bails off. Um, the argument will carry on for a long, long time because there are those entrenched on both sides and those wondering still what about or what is going on there. Ashwin has said it was his instinct. He said it's to do with the laws. If the laws are wrong, then MCC or whoever must look at those laws. I think there is more to it than that. And I'll say at this moment that I have immense respect for Ravi Ashwin as a cricketer and as a thinker in the game. His reputation in the inside is one of those who thinks very, very deeply about all aspects of the game. Uh, he says it was his instinct that made him do it. I think he needs to look at that instinct. I think he needs to think about it. And I think in time, he might well think that he's allowed to revise his thoughts on that particular incident. Um, I hope he does. Um, but that is my view of the whole situation in a nutshell. Um, and I think both men will happily move on. Both men will happily entertain us. Both men will continue to play the game with huge skill and they will not be short on style. But on that one occasion, I have a very clear image as to which one lacked style. So that is my take on that particular thing. It just so happens that it's very, very current and very fresh in our minds. So there is excellence around. There is style around. There are many, many people, as I can see from just looking at the numbers in this room, who want to keep the game where it should be, preeminent in this world, as a major, major event wherever it is, whether it be test cricket, whether it be one day international cricket, whether it be T20 cricket, cricket even, whether it be IPL, or whatever it is. And of course, we have something else to get our heads around in a year's time or so in the UK, something called the 100. 
and uh, I'll reserve comment on that until we've seen how and if it works. All these things are vital. Uh, one thing is equally vital, and I go back to the title of tonight's little speech. Uh, the fun element has to be part of it. If we all go back to childhood, if we look at why we initially loved sport, it was because someone, maybe a parent, maybe a school teacher, maybe a friend, introduced us to whatever sport it was. In my case, cricket became preeminent, but as I was growing up, soccer, football, rugby, tennis, all these things were games that I played and enjoyed. And enjoyed for the simple reason it was fun to be there. And the more fun you have, the better you get. There's this beautiful spiral that exists in the world of sport. The more fun you have, the better you get. The better you get, the more fun you have. Eventually, some people find a level. If that level happens to be international sport, then they've done seriously well. But if you lose the fun, you lose, I think, so much of the point. Because if you are bringing the next generation into sport, and you forget to use the word fun, then that becomes a mighty difficult task in my book. And for me, the enjoyment, the pleasure, all stem from being part of a world that was always going to be fun. It meant that there were moments that I might have let myself down professionally, and it was alluded to earlier, so I'm going to give you, whether you like it or not, I'm going to give you the full story of the tiger moth. And the reason I do that, and it struck me when I was thinking about this, is that obviously we started with one tiger, here we are beautifully, it might be a terrible pun, but with another tiger. So the tiger moth, to correct an impression, was in Carrara on the Gold Coast of Australia. England were playing Queensland on a tour led by Graham Gooch where we were already 2-0 down. Uh, Graham, as captain, was not a happy man. Uh, I can point out at this particular stage, I was doing okay. We'd played three test matches, and I'd got a couple of hundreds, top score in Brisbane as well, and I was personally thinking, okay, I cannot do an awful lot better than this. The problem with this particular game, let me set the scene. We've got Carrara, Gold Coast, and you've got a ground which is an Australian rules football ground normally, with a cricket pitch in the middle, lights, as everywhere has nowadays, at about 150 feet. And the sanguine feature was a small airstrip right next door. Two Tiger Moths, built 1940, give or take. Uh, English design, Australian build. And a bloke called Bruce probably flying both of them. Because as you know, everyone in Australia is called Bruce. <laughs> and on the third morning of this game, I got out for 13. A fellow called John Morris got a very good 100. And we took lunch, and I was thinking, what should we do this afternoon? The situation in the game is this. England actually ahead of the game. Queensland coming second. We are batting with a view of setting a target, a declaration, and trying to win the game on the fourth day. We have two of England's finest batsmen, Alan Lamb and Robin Smith, born in Durban and Langeban Vech, uh, irrespectively, it's the other way around, Langeban Vech and Durban, respectively. And their orders are to bat through the afternoon. So I thought I could just sneak away for half an hour, borrow a plane briefly, have a little look at the ground from above, maybe do the beaches as well, and what harm would there be? So oh, we left the ground, drove one minute to the airstrip, phoned back just in case there'd been a bit of a collapse, we might be needed to field within the half hour. No, all's well. Phone back again, having got the full Biggles kit on, the flying hat, the jacket, the scarf, the whole thing is on, we take off. We do two runs down the ground at 150 feet, down the line of the pitch, and we speak to our man behind, the pilot behind, and say, can we do the beaches as well? We have half an hour of sheer fun. We land safely. We get back to the ground. Things are going well. At the end of the day, uh, the press, all those long lenses, uh, no film cameras, all those long lenses has picked up the fact that people flying these planes or in these planes might have been England cricketers, in particular me and John Morris. Uh, we'd actually left the ground quite quickly at this stage. At the end of the day, I went off for dinner in the hills behind Carrara, behind the Gold Coast. England management were grilled and were asked the question, what did you think about the two boys in the planes? Even from my distance, a mile away, I could hear the sound of jaws dropping. Management takes what's known as a dim view. <laughs> they answer questions. They want to see us. 
I get back to my hotel room at about one o'clock, nice early night. <laughs> Behind my door are bits of paper. I read them one by one. Come and see me immediately, signed Peter Lush, tour manager. Come and see me as soon as you get in, signed Peter Lush, tour manager. Come and see me right now, immediately, no later, signed Peter Lush, tour manager. <laughs> Fuck it, come and see me tomorrow morning. Sorry about that. <laughs> Come and see me at 08.30 in the morning, signed Peter Lush, tour manager. So at 08.30, I was up, bright, and attending the manager's suite. Knocked on the door, invited in. Interesting situation. This being an Australian hotel room, it has a lounge with a bar. <laughs> and bar stools. One of the bar stools is cunningly placed in the middle of the room. Instinct told me this was mine. <laughs> Opposite were Peter Lush, tour manager, Mickey Stewart, England coach, Graham Gooch, England captain, Alan Lamb, England vice captain. Three of them looking deadly serious, Lammy pissing himself. <laughs> Again, instinct tells me the odds were slightly against me. We had this discussion, uh, the first thing I did, I've done this before, the first thing I did, again, instinct served me all, was apologize. I said, look, I'm really, really sorry. If anyone thinks this was uh, um, a wrong thing to do, um, I meant no harm, it was a little bit of fun, no, one, you know, no, no harm was done, and um, if it's upset you, I apologize. This turned into a talk about motivation. So I mentioned the fact that in three test matches so far, I've got hundreds at Melbourne, hundreds at Sydney, top scoring in Brisbane twice, um, and that as far as I was concerned, my motivation was doing all right. Maybe they should ask the other 15. <laughs> Again, dim view. <laughs> we agreed to call a halt to the conversation after an hour or so, went to the ground, won the game, flew to Adelaide for the next test match. We are still 2-0 down. We have two test matches to play. There is a chance we could at least draw the series. In the meantime, there are messages going from Adelaide to London. Peter Lush to the ECB in London, to Lords, the home, as we like to call Lords, the home of cricket. Um, they were going by Pigeon or Telex, whatever technology was current at the time. And the gist of it was that they decided that according to our tour contract, the maximum penalty was a £1,000 fine. And I think in those days, we were probably getting about 10 of those uh, for the entire four months. So that was quite a chunk out of out of the wages for the tour. But anyway, I was invited back to the next manager's room. Uh, this time there was no bar stool in the middle of it, just a couple of chairs, and we sat and discussed the matter. And Peter Lush said to me, right, we've decided what the penalty is, £1,000 fine. I said, thank you. Um, how do I pay that? He said, it will be deducted from your tour fees at source at Lord's. I said, is that before or after tax? <laughs> no, I love it, I love it. We've got accountants here as well, I love it. He said tax will also be deducted at source at laws. I said, do you mind if I pay cash? As it happens, I had two and a half thousand dollars. I'm sure Tiger would have done the same, to be honest. Two and a half thousand dollars on me, handed it across, got the receipt, and made a mental note that everything I'd said beforehand about being in good form, determined, um, keen to show how much on board with the captain and the team I was, all those things went through my mind as I left the room and as we started that fourth test match of the series a day later. First day, Graham Gooch wins the toss, and England bat first on a good pitch. There's a little bit of weather around. We don't play a full day's cricket. We are two down at the close of play on day one. Graham Gooch is still there, not out, probably about 80 or so, and I'm at number five. So the following morning, I'm ready and waiting again to prove my points. Halfway through the session, the third wicket goes down, and I walk out to bat, focusing more than ever, I can honestly say, on the prospect of batting and batting well. But I am distracted, and this proves that Australians do indeed have a sense of humour, because on the PA system at that particular moment, they played those magnificent men in their flying machines. <laughs> so 
Sadly, there is a, a codicil to that story, which I then played both the worst cricket of my life about the next hour and got out to the last ball before lunch. It was not an interesting dress, well, it was not a happy dressing room to be in, <laughs> with Graham Gooch and I, the only occupants for the next half hour or so. But the story proves only one thing. There is somehow scope for a bit of fun in and around what is a very serious game, a very professional game. I suspect I will remain unique as a man to have done exactly that. I dare say there will be other moments of humor, other moments of fun that the current generation get up to. Um, but there is something like a golden rule, which is that every generation thinks it has more fun than you did, or you will. And I've seen that happen many, many a time. Um, but it is key to the game. It is key to everything we do. As I say, everything we teach our children, everyone we want to try and inspire to be part of this game. Everyone want to carry on the legacy of this game. And again, the numbers here tonight, the numbers you'll see at stadiums all around the world for a lot of the cricket that's on show nowadays prove that there are a lot of people who feel exactly the same way. So my message is that fun, style, and excellent are good for us all. If I have um, a final message, it is along those same lines, to preserve what, it pre what is precious. Preserve what is precious. It could be tigers, both four-legged and two-legged. It could be test cricket. It could be cricket as a whole. But future generations deserve both. Thank you very, very much indeed. Can I just... On a, on a personal note uh, as well here tonight, I, mean, I hope you've enjoyed that in some shape or form. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I do have to say some thank yous. It's been one of the great things about my career is that it's allowed me to travel the world, certainly the cricketing world, at length. Um, I've had a fascination for all the places I've been to, be it Australia, New Zealand, the Caribbean, South Africa, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, actually yet to get to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, but I've always had an affection for coming here to this country because it is a country that absolutely adores this game of cricket. And it's been very kind to me over the years, many, many years. And again, on this trip, it's only a few days, sadly, um, but my thanks to the Obroy. Um, GM, thank you very much indeed for your hospitality here. I've been looked after exceptionally well to the Telegraph. Uh, Lakendra, who's brought me here, whose invitation it was that I was very happy to accept to be part of all this. To all those on this board behind, all the sponsors, all those who made it possible, a very, very big thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.